lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. For today's case, we're going to be covering one of the sickest killers that I have ever heard of. The hunchback cannibal, Thomas Burns. Before continuing to listen, please check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any trigger warnings. And today's case is quite heavy, so please make sure you check those trigger warnings. Now usually I like to give you all a bit of information about the backgrounds and the upbringings of the people that I speak about. However, there was such little information about the people in today's case, so I can only tell you the small details that I could find. Thomas Lionel Burns was born in 1887. When his mother was pregnant, she was involved in a terrible accident where a heavy window actually fell on her. This resulted in her baby, Thomas, who just went by Tom to be born with a hunchback. By age 12, Tom had dropped out of school and he would spend his day cleaning steam cars. He was born and brought up in the south of the country, but eventually made his way up to Burrow and Furness, where today's case takes place. Here he lived a regular, normal life, mainly working as a chauffeur, and when he retired, he spent most of his free time playing the piano in his home at number 32 York Street. On the 11th of June, 1958, it was a lovely, warm summer's day, and friends, Sheila Barnes and Lavinia Murray, who were both five years old, were outside playing on York Street. They were so young and happy and just full of life and just being kids outside enjoying themselves in summer. As they walked along York Street, music began to fill the air and being the inquisitive girls that these were, they decided to investigate and try and find the source of this music. This is how they entered number 32 York Street. They would not leave this address alive. As the hours passed, the parents of Sheila and Lavinia began to worry. They had last seen their daughters at about 7.45 p.m. and now it was getting a bit late, it was getting dark and they still weren't home. By the next day, the police were notified and now the whole town were out in help and searching for the five-year-olds. Along with many volunteers, police enlisted the help of frogmen and sea cadets to search the local rivers and reservoir, and they also had the help of sniffer dogs as well. During their searches and door-to-door -door inquiries, a certain house stood out to officers. This house looked like it had no movement from the inside and the curtains were drawn closed. This was 32 York Street. An officer knocked at the door, but no one answered. Later that day, he went back to the house, determined to speak to the person inside, and this time, the person inside answered. Opening the door was frail-looking, hunched back, 71-year-old Tom Burns. When asked if he could help regarding the inquiry in the missing girls, he responded, quote, No, I'm sorry, I cannot. I only wish I could. It's a bad business. The officer then asked Tom if he had an outhouse out the back. Tom said that he did and that he had checked it and no one was there. He was then asked if he had been out at any point the previous day or night, to which Tom said that he hadn't been out. He was apparently really, really poorly and he was in bed by 5pm that night. He even admitted to the officer that he heard him knocking earlier on in the day, but because he was so poorly, he couldn't get up to answer the door. After this, the officer left and advised Tom if he heard anything or saw anything or he knew anything to contact them. This whole interaction really stuck with the officer and he just knew that something wasn't right. I guess the police can really read people very well. So the next day he went back to Tom's house, arriving at 10.25 a.m. and this is now two days since Sheila and Lavinia went missing. Tom led the officer through the house and into the kitchen and they sat and began to talk about the girls and their disappearance. Tom commented saying, quote, Yes, I heard about it. Isn't it terrible? I think someone has taken them away in a car. So very early on, Tom is deflecting blame. He was then asked if any children at all had knocked on his door on the 11th and he said that there hadn't. 
He even added more detail saying his door was always locked and that he lived alone and this just really gave off the impression that Tom was being deceitful. He was offering more information that wasn't really asked, he wasn't asked if his door was locked and all the information that he was given was really deflecting him from the crime. The officer asked Tom if he could take a look in his backyard and this really took Tom by surprise and kind of agitated him. He replied saying, quote, There is no need, I have been in the shed and no one is there. But the officer went and checked anyways. Inside an outhouse or shed, there was freshly dug mud and a recently dug hole. It was three feet long, one foot wide and one foot deep. And it really resembled a grave. Tom tried to explain this away, saying that he had been doing some gardening and he even pointed to some like flower bulbs that he was going to plant but clear panic was all over his face. The officer knew he had to investigate the house further so he asked Tom if he could have a look around the house, specifically the bedrooms. Tom became defensive and outright said that no, the officer could not go upstairs due to sentimental reasons and that even he himself hadn't been upstairs for weeks. The officer pressed Tom about his refusal and he replied sternly, quote, Whatever you say, you're not going up. It's in a mess. It would be all right if my wife was here, but she's in Roos. Roos is a nearby village, but what Tom hadn't realised is that he had tripped himself up. He said earlier that he lived alone and made no mention of a wife at all, so now his lies were beginning to catch up to him. Tom's change in demeanour and his outright refusal to allow the officer to go upstairs really told the officer that he absolutely had to go upstairs because what was Tom hiding? What was he so scared for the officer to find and why was he lying? What was he lying about? The officer shoved past Tom who really couldn't stop him and began to ascend the stairs. As he walked up the stairs, the officer heard Tom under his breath saying, quote, I'm buggered now. Upstairs in the main bedroom, the officer found the bodies of five-year-olds Sheila Barnes and Lavinia Murray. They were both naked and one girl was lay in a wicker basket and the other was lay on a mattress. It was clear that the girls had been mutilated. Their throats had been cut and they were missing body parts which were later described as steak size. Poor Sheila's foot had been completely cut off and an attempt to amputate a leg was made. Her eyes were incredibly swollen and this was said to have been from her crying so much while she was dying. Lavinia's injury to her neck was so severe that she was almost decapitated. We would later find out that both girls were raped and they were mutilated down there with a knife. After the discovery of the bodies, Tom had suddenly become ill and faint and wanted to sit down. When asked why he had done this to these poor innocent girls, he replied, quote, sex made me do them in. He made a full confession telling police officers, quote, I was playing the piano when they came in. I showed them how to play. They came in here and I undressed them. I was sitting in this chair. They laugh when I felt their bottoms. I don't know what came over me, but I picked up a knife off the table and just cut the ginger girl's throat. The other one laughed at me. She was standing over there. I cut her throat. He also confessed to raping Sheila and Lavinia and this disgusting creature even said that he could have possibly performed necrophilia, but he couldn't really remember. Tom explained to the officers that on the 12th, the day after the girls went missing, he had cut off Sheila's foot, roasted it, and then ate it. Back at the house, there was actually a used plate which had remnants of meat on it, and it was later proved that this had traces of human blood. Like I mentioned, there were steak-sized pieces of flesh missing from the girls' bodies, and they were never found in the house, so it's safe to assume that he probably ate those as well. He had eaten part of the girls. 
when Tom was arrested and taken from his house, he was surrounded by officers. This is the only picture that we have of Tom, which is of him when he's being arrested. Furious members of the community crowded around the house, shouting at him and even throwing bricks through his windows. The community were devastated by the loss of Sheila and Lavinia and then hearing the details of what had happened and actually seeing the person who'd done this just filled the bystanders with fury. They really wanted to get at him and kill him. In October 1958, Thomas Burns arrived at Lancaster Assizes preparing for trial. However, it was found by a jury that he was insane, thus unfit to stand trial. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure and this is the last that we hear of Tom so it's safe to assume that he probably died there but I couldn't say when. It's widely believed that this is not Tom's first murder. It's really hard to fathom that you can go from a normal 71 year old man enjoying your retirement to a double murderer who raped, mutilated and ate two five year old girls. It's just unthinkable. And that is today's awful case. Now you can all understand why I think Tom is one of the sickest killers I've ever heard of. He took these beautiful, innocent, curious girls and just done the unthinkable to them. I actually had to leave out some quotes from Tom because they were just so graphic and awful. I really did try to find some background on Sheila and Lavinia to find out what type of girls they were and who they were but like I said at the beginning of the video there was just nothing there for me to find. Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. I have linked all of my social media in the description box if you would like to follow me on any of my other platforms. I do true crime cases on my TikTok as well. I have also linked all of my source material there too. Please don't forget to like and share this video and if you haven't already make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my future uploads. And yeah thank you all so much again and I'll see you all on my next one.